Good afternoon, good evening, good night for wherever you are. <laughs> good morning in some cases. I was just thinking about the, the term parami that you all know. That means uh, spiritual forces, qualities, um, qualities that are developed from our practice. Uh, so past practice of mindfulness or metta, for example, uh, results in having more opportunity to express, abide in that awareness, abide in that metta, and to have it affect how we think and how we speak and how we act in the world. And then uh, it has the power to bring us together again into Dharma situations in this lifetime. Uh, and if we, if we take to it, if those paramis get awakened, our interest grows. We do a sitting and we read a book, we get inspired. We do a day long, uh, a weekend, and then we start doing retreats. And then each time we practice, we mature, we grow those paramis more. Uh, and just briefly, those paramis are qualities we're all familiar with, like generosity, uh, sila, um, renunciation, energy, wisdom, patience, truth, resolution, metta, uh, equanimity. Metta is actually the catalyst for all the other paramis to mature, uh, to grow. Uh, so, it's an extremely powerful part of our practice, uh, probably mentioned more than any other term in the ancient discourses outside of mindfulness itself. So it's paramis that have brought us together. And I'm just thinking for this retreat and under the circumstances of this year, um, the paramis had to cut through a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty. Right now, it's the intensity of, of, of two powerful worldwide um, conditions, social unrest and a pandemic. I don't have any recollection of anything close in my lifetime. In terms of social, social rest, what came close to it is in 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated and two months later, Robert Kennedy uh, running for president was assassinated five, year, five years before that. I uh, was 16 and our president Kennedy was assassinated. Very tumultuous era and it shaped those of us who were alive then. It shaped the direction. So there was a power me at play in that time. It made me look for answers um, inside. When I went through all the issues going on, I, I was an activist, anti-war, and doing sit-ins at the universities and so forth. But when I went down the line of all the issues, I felt it was a fundamental uh, issue of um, spiritual tribalism. Uh, there was a fragmentation of our sense of spirituality. And that's what took me that on the direction inward to look for something that a source that applied to all the unrest happening. And, and so today, you know, first with the pandemic or earlier this year, put us all in a kind of enforced retreat condition, whether or not we used it, you know, it was like dependent on our circumstances or our interests at the time. But the power of me forces were still at play because here we are. Here we are in the conditions that brought us here um, unpleasant, most of it, um, and yet here we are, and we're together in this unified uh, Dhamma space that we've created virtually and in our separate temples at home, the room you're in, or the, the house that you're in, or the house and garden where you're practicing. Continue, if you can, to Im imbue the space around you, to make it sacred. You know, bring 
some flowers in and move some things around and just have a sense of never seen things quite the same way when you walk from one side of the room to the other, whether it's a formal practice walking or a meditative walk. Just see this how we when we soften our senses just slightly. We'll see things differently, we'll hear things differently, we'll feel things differently. First externally and then gradually our interior. And then we'll begin to feel the nature of these parami forces when we when we start to practice, when we start to pay attention, when we find our safe refuge, our home anchor. So where is that? The body, the temple of the body, the breath as an anchor, our hands, our feet, sound sometimes, a, a visual image. Sometimes an anchor is a, is a memory of a peaceful place or time in our lives in the past that restores uh, a sense of peace and connection if we're feeling anxious. At a certain point, the, the, out, the outward and the inward, the external and the interior, uh, they feel the same. Doesn't, there's no inside or outside. There just is. Uh, we, we settle in more. We settle in more to the body. We settle in more to the senses. And our practice is with our bodies and with our senses. And with awareness that they all awaken, they all begin to see nature as it is, that we begin to be able to, to move, to bridge from our day-to-day -day conventional conceptual reality across into this sacred land uh, where we can say it's, it's, it's the parami of the moment, the parami of the present, the fruition of the paradigms of, of the past is our practice of the present and the quality of our awareness. So the third parami, for example, renunciation is another word for meditation because we're renouncing grasping moment to moment or nektama, the word for renunciation means letting go, or not holding on moment to moment, not letting, not holding, not holding on. And then to inhabit, inhabit this present time parami space in, in the heart, and to feel it, to appreciate it, feel the connection. We might begin by calling up um, a sense of the purpose of our practice to be of benefit to ourselves and all beings. You can do that at any time, at the beginning or the end of practice, but it might set a nice tone at the beginning. It's a form of metta really, it's a form of compassion and wisdom, knowing that this a moment of awareness, a moment of insight has reverberating effects on our own system and on all beings and throughout the universe. It's a very, it's what makes it, what we do, it's what makes it sacred. And the parami powerful enough to have affect on all beings. So just collecting ourselves right now, appreciating with mudita, all the years of practice that we've had, our months. It's working to some degree because we're here but that that's the effect of the parami. And holding and appreciating our acts, you know, just to simplify them, all our acts of generosity and all our acts of non-harming, sila, and all our acts of meditative awareness and loving kindness. I dedicate my practice to all beings everywhere. Very simple.
before each session of practice, you can do this. Sometimes maybe a particular person, family, or group. Sometimes just the open, diffuse, a sense of reaching all, all life forms, wherever they are. There you go. I just I lost my screen. Over there, it's just me that. Um, and then taking our attention through, through the body, the eyes, whether they're open or closed, a sense of soft senses soft gazing, the beginner's mind gaze, where we're not staring at anything. We're not focused in on any particular thing. It's just the, the color scape and the sound scape, sound vibrations. And then the body landscape of touch sensations. Letting the body too, even though there might be areas of pain or pressure or tension, there are always other areas where there is no tension and no pain. It's not to reject the one and cling to the other, but just being aware of, of both. A particular meditation that can be helpful sometimes is just an awareness wash through the body, attuned to the, the visceral felt sense sensations or elements as they're known in the practice, like the earth element are, includes all the textures from soft, to smooth, to silky, to grainy, uh, rough, hard, all those textures. This is the body, not what we perceive with our, our eyes, our visual thoughts, our learning, but the conditioned way that we see the body as these component parts or the mirror image, but rather pure touch and texture. And the water element is the sense of either fluidity or cohesion, the areas of the body that feel in flow. The cohesion where the sensations seem to collect sometimes at in times of um, the elements expressing themselves in extreme ways, the cohesion along with the, the earth element, you might feel hardness, which is unpleasant, painful, or cohesion and the fire element, like a ball of heat, also unpleasant, painful, or cold. And the heat element itself is the vast range between uh, just the soft, cool breeze might cool the body to cold, freezing, and then going into the other direction, a cool, warmth, warm, hot, searing. And the two extremes, usually unpleasant. The, a balance in the middle, often quite pleasant. So I ask, you know, when, when you feel a lot of heat someplace, look for some place where you feel coolness without clinging, without pushing away. And the element, the air element, is how we're supported, how we can sit up, how we can stand, uh, how we can reach, that supportive element like wind in a sail, air in a balloon. 
Those are felt sense experiences. We can actually know the body how it is. We don't have to associate and then psychologically analyze uh, earth, water, fire, air. Just the body never lies. We just relax and let our attention arise from within the body. And there it is, that, that feeling, that healthy tension of support, uprightness, firmness. And the other spectrum that it moves towards is movement and oscillation. And finally, vibration down to very, very subtle, often very pleasant vibration, sometimes felt throughout the entire body. Like the four Brahma Viharas, these four elements are inseparable. They always arise together. You can take any one and they're all there, like a drop of water. Well, it's cohesion aspect of the water element is obvious, but it has texture if we're able to touch it. If it's frozen, it's hard. If it's just a drop, it's soft. Uh, and if it's moving, uh, that's the air element aspect. If it's cool, that's the fire element aspect. So we can't separate them, but some dominate. And thus I say, when there's pain, we can look behind the concept, the curtain, a concept we call pain. And then even through the unpleasantness of it, the mind settled and interested, investigating, and then and seeing, seeing on the sort of micro level where that particular pain is. Is it like a pinprick, a sharp pain? And if it's continuing, and we've been with it for a while, feeling it, noticing how it manifests. Does it get does it amplify with our concentrated awareness? Does it disappear and then seem to reappear? Does it soften? Does it change? What happens with it? And for those unpleasant and painful areas of the body that continue, I can find it interesting often then just to look first nearby or if needed some other part of the body. That's just the opposite. That doesn't have a sharp pinprick type of sensation, but rather a light tingling, soft vibration that's quite pleasant. Without judgment, just the discerning awareness, without then ignoring the pinprick and clinging to the soft, lovely vibration. It's just what it is. It's the body showing us its nature. It's anicca nature. It's changing nature. And like with all of our experience, we just start, we start to discover that uh, it's impermanent. It's imperfect. And it's impersonal. It's always changing. It's unreliable. And it's empty of any solid, permanent, continuous self. This process that we call this body, our body. The word investigation, sometimes it, uh, it strikes people, I was talking to some yogis today, as being more a conceptual investigation or analysis. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it. It's actually another word for wisdom, discerning phenomena, called dhamma vachya, discernment of these elemental nature of the body, textures, temperatures, movement, vibration, and their nature. What is their nature? To appear, exist, vanish, arise, pass away. It's not about holding the concept of the Buddha's teaching, the Dhamma um, doctrines, and then seeing how we can apply them to the body. And sometimes it's helpful just to slightly incline the mind towards seeing the endings of things, to attune to anicca nature, which is often most available 
in the beginning of our practice. Watching sensations and their very vibratory nature is an indication of, of process. We look closely, the pinprick isn't lasting. And that subtle, very pleasant sensation in another part of the body itself is also in constant, the very vibrating nature is its appearance, very short existence, and then disappearance. So we're working a lot with understanding the crucial, the critical teaching of the Buddha that he made very prominent, the conditionality of things. Our bodies, our, our thoughts, what we hear, what we see. The majority of our experience, conditioned experience, comes from causes, from conditionality. Uh, and that conditionality, the nature of that conditionality is impermanence and unreliability, fragility or vulnerability, and of impersonality. I'm not doing it. It's not happening to me. The conditions that cause that anger are conditions. It's not blame. It's not our fault. Something happens and we have this what we, you hear us calling karmic knots in early, early childhood abandonment, for example. One of my karmic knots, where suddenly uh, our mom disappears. It's like the universe disappears. And we don't know that because maybe we're five months old and, and we're at a pre-verbal development stage. We have no idea. We can't process that. And, and even later, 19, 20, 22 months, when we are able to conceptualize, we can't reach back to those pre-verbal times and determine what happened. We just get triggered at various times throughout our lives that brings up that old karmic knot. Every meditator has them. And you all experience the various kinds of triggering of old traumas, old karmic wounds that appear what do we do? How do we work with them? We try to understand that it's not our fault, the conditionality of phenomena. We go to the body. The body tells the truth. We look for and abide in the awareness of the various sensations, sometimes very intense, sometimes too intense. And we need to go to a safe harbor, to sounds, another place in the body where we can just rest our attention, regroup, settle, not be reactive, not feel blame, not feel we need to fix anything. And then when we have the energy and discernment, we can return if that phenomena, that previous conditioned phenomena is still there. It can help to use wise reflection. Oh, this is a conditioned phenomenon. This, this is a perhaps a, a triggering of an old wound, karmic knot. We may not know what it is. It might, by nature, be fuzzy, be obscured. Like for in my case, I had this pre-verbal wounding. So I have, I'll, I'll never have a clear memory of that. I'll only have a, a felt sense of that. But it'll, there'll never be a story with it. I only know that because Michelle asked my mom <laughs> once when she started going to work and how old I was. And my mom said, oh, Stephen was about five months old. Uh, powerful, painful, and, and liberating to begin to know what that is and then to learn ways of working with that you know, when we can. So a lot of times it will be an area that's just blank, or as I say, numb or obscured, emotional, uh, emotions that are not def clearly defined, seem to be blocked or fuzzy. And they may always be that way. Uh, other emotions come in about that. 
maybe if, we're, if we stay with that long enough, we're really mindful of, of condition phenomena and understand the conditionality of it. And that all phenomena of the body and mind, all these elements and the emotions, mental moods and um, thoughts, emotions, it's all conditioned phenomena. And it becomes an insight, a breakthrough, as happened with the Buddha when he was practicing. You know, suddenly he said, I, I saw, I saw how things work. I saw I had a breakthrough. I saw conditionality. And he said specifically, I had vision, I had knowledge, I had uh, wisdom. I had true knowledge. Equivalent with liberating knowledge. And I had light. Uh, and that's, he was explaining when he first had a Dhamma experience, touched the Dhamma, like an early insight into how things work, an early awakening, awakening moment. So we'll have those insights and sometimes they may be a little disturbing because afterwards we try to integrate it with our normal lives, our conventional lives, when we put our, our, our clothes back on for relating, shopping, doing the things we do. Uh, and yet we, we might not have quite come out of this deep insight. Things may seem pixelated colors and sounds, bodily sensations, you know, we don't quite feel we're, we're in our own body because when we have that kind of vision, when we have that kind of opening, there's a, a release from a trance state, a trance on continuity. That is, we're fixated on permanence a permanent self, a permanent security, a permanent relationship, permanent health, you know, permanent social rest, whatever it is that we're fixated on. But this insight is a release of that fixation and uh, of that enchantment. And an insight stage called disenchantment is where we let go of all that previous conditioning and hold fixation, trance-like attachment to how things are and how we want them to be. It's not painful. How it was is painful. The actual insight is liberating. There's always joy. There's always a pleasant sense that comes along with a moment of insight, even into dukkha, into a lot of pain, because it's the truth. When awareness touches the truth, truth, the heart always releases, let's go. So the most painful thing can be very liberating. For all of the external pain going on, one way of working with that external mean in the world, the social unrest, the pandemic, just going into the body, trying to set aside the story, the narrative, and feel the feelings. You know, most of you know, I often say, feeling is healing. Mindful, felt sense of an experience, sensation, an emotion, or cluster of emotions, mind states, thoughts, and reflections, feeling that happening free of a story about it, free of mental proliferation, is liberating, is the truth. And for a moment, we understand what cessation is. Cessation is the, is the essence of conditionality, that whatever arises, whatever is born, passes away, ceases. We're actually having cessation every micro moment. And, and when we're practicing, we may have a little series of insights or sometimes a medium or quite profound insight 
where we really see this phenomenon. There really is a cessation of that connection between dukkha and the cause of dukkha in grasping, clinging, intense or excessive attachment. In the moment of seeing that relationship, it ceases. The connection between dukkha and its cause of clinging ceases. There's a gap. A deep insight, one often feels like they go into that gap. And there's a very clear inside awareness that doesn't have any self-reference, no sense of self that's seeing it. It's not coming from book knowledge or what we've heard. It's actual experience. Uh, yeah. Conditioned phenomenon. All conditioned things have the nature to arise and to pass away every sensation, every element of the body. This takes some time now together uh, with your eyes closed if you can. And take our interest and take this uh, discernment of phenomena what we often call investigation. And notice what's happening in the body right now from within the body, not from the head. The element's been stirred up in some way. There's some places where they seem more intense than others. Some areas where the sensations are, are softer, lighter more fluid or more tense. And what about the home anchor, the body as a whole, or the breath felt from within the breathing, within the rising, and the breath felt from within the falling motion. What emotions or moods are there? Are they being purely noticed or are they being self-referenced as my calm, my anxiety, my fear, my courage, my doubt, my confidence? Sometimes just notice the quality of this observing awareness helps to sidestep the self-referencing that there is an, an I that's being aware rather than it's awareness that's aware. See for yourself.
in the last <clears throat> uh, five minutes with awareness still within the body, the pasana, felt sense, experiential awareness, feeling the various contours, shapes, forms of texture, fluidity and cohesion, heat and warmth, coolness, firmness, support, tension, or movement, oscillation, vibration. While within the body, call up one of the Brahma Viharas. See which one the body takes to. Call up metta and then just sit with that. See where it lodges, if it lodges, the warmth, the tenderness, the connection, unconditional loving kindness. And then calling up Karuna, a fearless compassion, a pleasant quality of care, wherever there's pain, distress, fear, suffering of any kind. Where is that? You feel that in the body. Just for ourselves for now. And calling up Murita, appreciative joy, empathy, delighting in the happiness wherever we find it in ourselves, in other beings, in life. is that experience in the body. Where, where is it? Upeka, which literally means to look over, to look upon rather than to look away. The quality of a finely balanced heart mind that's able to hold extremes, opposites, or the fiction of opposites, pleasure, pain, gain, and loss, praise, and blame, and understand here's where the wisdom part comes in and understanding the conditionality. We all experience these opposites pleasant, unpleasant, joy and sorrow due to causes and conditions. And here the equanimity is the result of disenchantment, not being allured by the myriad poles, magnetic poles to the world. We're learning all four of these Brahma Viharas and that they're all connected and they always arise together. But the one that maybe stands out the most have that sense of connecting and abiding that is fully resting in it. Being that metta or compassion. Being that joy or being that peace of equanimity.
Thank you for your practice and attention. Well, I want to just briefly mention something about the skillful use of mental labeling as a reminder. You've all heard of it. And um, some of you use it, some of you use it sometimes, some of you don't use it at all. As a practice tool, it can be useful in helping to eliminate um, nature. For example, the nature of the body. I spoke earlier of the body is just these four elements uh, in following their own law, their own dance. Um, we forget because we're so used to having a pleasant or unpleasant experience in the body, pain or pleasure, uh, in the arm or leg or head and so forth. So the soft label can sometimes be helpful just to remind that what we're actually experiencing is, for example, pinpricks. Now that, that's a, it's a constant sensation for me. I, I had a stroke 17 months ago, but my whole left side uh, is often just pinpricks. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I, I feel it, I go through it, little moment by moment, feeling all those little sensations, pinprick sensations. And any irritation or reaction that happens, or the unpleasant quality of it. And then sometimes I go to my right side, uh, which is fluid and, and free of pain and, and stronger and health, healthier than the left. Just by discernment, by comparison. I can't just choose to have my right side. <laughs> you know, I need my right side to help the left side repair, you know, along with my heart and my rehab practices and disciplines. But it helps, the, oh yeah, just ten pricks. It helps if I'm a little reactive or irritated and don't want those unpleasant sensations to notice uh, tensing, tightness, the seizures, the pinpricks, the numbness, just the name, that's all. And, and then the label drops away, becomes invisible. And the awareness enters into the experience and knows it from the inside, not from the head. And feels through the duration of that patch of pinpricks as long as it might last or to move my attention elsewhere if necessary. Same too with emotions that seem to circulate around and around or become uh, obsessive stories. Sometimes naming it is like uh, the heroine in the ancient mythologies who, when she names the dragon, the curse that was placed upon her by the dragon uh, falls away. So sometimes just naming something like fear. There's a true awareness of fear as a phenomena, as a conditioned phenomena that is impermanent and Im impersonal and an imperfect, imperfect aspect of our personality. Just to name it, to feel it, so that we, it can be known. And, and as the Buddha said with his realization of conditionality, that, that was, this was my breakthrough, this was my vision and uh, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This is, this is the path of awakening, he said. So use the, the labels if they're helpful. Maybe getting started when walking, lifting, moving, placing. Maybe by the end of the walking stretch, you don't need that anymore. That you, you feel the lift from within the lifting leg, not from imagination, not from looking at your leg or feet, um, and not through the head. But just the sensations of pulling and lifting up and stretching and pushing and lowering, touching, placing, pressure. So when the labels help, that attunement, opening to that truth, that reality, use them. When they're not helpful, drop them.
with a few minutes left, if anyone has any questions for us about the labeling or about your practice, practice questions. It's kind of short to the point. And, and so, yes, Quinn. Turn your, uh, turn your sound on, Quinn. Can't hear you, Quinn. Unmute. Unmute. You can? Okay. okay. Uh, Steve, you talk about disenchantment. Uh, yes. I, I don't really understand what it meant. Yes. But uh, yesterday I, uh, I had an experience while I did mindful walking mm -hmm. uh, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. There were certain sounds that brought about uh, profound sadness and mm -hmm. deep longing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't understand that, where it came from, why it mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, I would just mm -hmm. run away from that. Mm -hmm. But yesterday I stayed with it. I, I try to investigate it and brought some effort to understand it. Um, after a while, then sadness is just sadness. Uh, mm. it's, it's an unpleasant emotion. And then it dropped. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt very much at peace with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I still don't connect that with disenchantment. Well, when we're, when we're enchanted and we're allured by the world, by pleasant or unpleasant experience, we're identified with it. And there's some drive to make our reality constant, the sense of constantly, permanently secure, our real, our me, mine, self. The disenchantment is when we, that, that pull to the world to make it how we want it, to be attracted to this and unattracted to that, um, it falls away. It's kind of like a, a healthy uh, release of, of all the ways that we idealize the world, our idealized experience. That we, we think that that's what we want, or we think that's how it should be, or, or we think that we need to get rid of that. So as a result of your investigation, it's like the, the, that connection, that allurement, enchantment with the world falls away and you see sadness as it is. Because it's impermanent. It's impersonal. It's following its own law. The, the triggering, you don't need to figure out. Whatever sounds were early triggers or traumas that brought up the sadness, we don't need to understand that. We just need to understand that the sadness is happening in the moment. The healing comes in those karmic knots from our pre-verbal awareness, because so much of our wounding is itself pre-verbal. So to look for a story, to look for a narrative actually is a distraction. Is that a follow? Yeah. Another question? Is that your hand, Mary? Yeah, it's not really a question. I just, um, out of my deep practice and care for both of you, um, I just want to put these words in our container that I don't, and what I'm practicing very deeply with is I don't see us as having a pandemic and social unrest. I, I really uh, see this as an opportunity for those of us who have been incarnated in this lifetime in a white body to heal and transform the racial karma that is ripening in this moment and take responsibility to heal and transform that. Um, so yeah, I, in this moment, I just really want uh, that language to be um, voiced 
uh, as I practice deeply to heal and transform the benefits and privileges that I have um, unearned because I'm white and at the cost of my humanity and at, uh, yeah, so I, 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 see, I, I really, uh, as a result of the love and wisdom practice that I have received from you, I just want to offer that with as much love and wisdom as I can in this moment. Thank you very much. Any other direct practice related questions? We have another couple of minutes. So it's time for, for walking. <clears throat> Just like to suggest, you know, we, teachers were talking this morning, yesterday afternoon. Um, as much as you can <clears throat> protect your your practice space and avoid <clears throat> too much um, going into events in the world at this time. It's very rare to create cut out solitude, seclusion, the security of, of, of a practice space like this. It's, it's rare and it's precious. And it's a very vulnerable, very vulnerable place, very personal to each of us, as well as the impersonality of all of our connectedness. So we're trying to stay, um, to sidestep a lot of the content that's not directly helpful, like what the Buddha defines as wise reflection in terms of our practice and the practice progress and stability and, and anchoring in the moment and seeing the very truths that do solve uh, our prejudices and our um, differences and, and our connection, our separation from things in the world. So. There's plenty of time for, for the, the, the narratives that are going on, important as they are. For, for practice purposes, please discern the difference between these kinds of thoughts, which by their nature are conceptual thoughts and the, the non-conceptual experiential being in our bodies, how it is. Uh, and, trying to let go of attachment to our views and how we think we should be or others should be, or how we think we should think or others think. Try to understand and let that understanding be, as the Buddha said, this is the path of awakening. Thank you. A lot of smiles out there. Dhamma smiles. <laughs> You're all very cute. 